<laughs> you said that I'm Switzerland in World War II since I'm friends with both you and Gordon and yeah. John. A uh, very rich country. Are you a Hitler or a Stalin, by the way, in this analogy? Would you like to be Hitler or Stalin? And should you make a t-shirt out of it or? I mean, a I think, Nazi t-shirt, I don't know how well that sells. Yeah. I think it would, you know, I think that, <laughs> let's brainstorm out on this one offline. <laughs> and I think since Hitler lost, so he got second place in World War II. That's I think, true, that's I true. Think that makes you Hitler. Anyway, uh, in, to the degree that you can, can you tell the story of how the time you've had with the, the Donahue Death Squad and, and uh, why you split up? I competed against Gordon for ADCC and EBI in 2017. And I remember I competed against him at ADCC, and then we had the EBI event, and then I had a Kasai. I, I, I used to compete all the time, every week. I wouldn't even do the pre preparation or anything. I'd just be like trying to do seminars, make money, and then jump in and compete. I remember I showed up to Kasai after I faced him twice, and there were like four locker rooms, and they put me with all the DDS guys. It was just me and all of DDS, and I think we had competed the week weekend before. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was going to be super awkward, but it was actually... It was actually pretty chill. And the Kasai was in New York and they suggested to come train that week. So I came trained, hung out with them a bit. Uh, ultimately the goal was to move to America and join a bigger team just because that flight to Australia is death. Australia is so far away from everywhere. It's kind of like not realistic to base yourself in Australia when all the tournaments are in America. And then I went and trained with the guys and they just had a massive, uh, massively deep talent pool in that room like show up to like a meant to be 7 a.m actual 8 a.m class uh on brazilian time and there'd be like a hundred people in there maybe i don't know how many black belts but a ton of elite guys and i was coming from australia um training with lachlan giles but really that room was pretty shallow and like most people had serious jobs and stuff so it was like basically me just training with lachlan maybe a couple of other guys and then to go to new york and have access to a a wide array of training partners and guys that are training twice each day. I feel like that's what you really need. You need people that can train as much as you are. Work you get humbled? humbled? You get humbled in that room at first? For sure. Because my style at the time was basically a rip-off version of what they were doing. Yeah. Leg locks came in. I remember just watching Eddie Cummings nonstop and just seeing this guy rip people's legs off. And I was like, you know what? That's probably a good move. You know, that looks like an easier path to victory than trying to beat these guys at what, they, what they're good at already, you know? My philosophy at the time was, if it's bothering old Brazilians, yeah. it's bothering them for a reason. Yeah. It's probably effective. And that's the path I took to sort of try to rip off their moves, and then obviously to go into that room, try to do them to them, it's gonna be a bit more difficult. All right, so that's how it started. How did you end up here? How do we end up here? We're in Austin, Texas. I mean, I like to think of Puerto Rico as apocalypse now. Mm -hmm. John Danaher as Colonel Kurtz. Things got very weird in the jungle, and the teams went in two different directions. But honestly, I mean, it's not really my story to tell. I had some uh, issues with some of those people. At the time of the split, I got along very well with John. I feel like me and him connected very well. I don't know. Why that was, maybe it was just because of the, he missed home, he missed a familiar accent, Australian, New Zealand accent. Uh, but I mean, I basically followed Nikki, yeah. left with Nikki, sort of that core group of guys left with Nikki. And I mean, I just back, there was personal problems and I just backed Nikki, basically. Got it. Just sticking on you for a bit. Is there a part of you that, you know, finds it heartbreaking that DDS split up? Does part of you miss working with John and everybody? Now, can you steal me on the case for that? I mean, I miss certain aspects of it, but I also do prefer the freedom of being apart from it. It's obviously a very strict regime under John Danaher. You know, obviously there's parts of it. I miss the parts the, the public doesn't see of John, the behind the scenes banter. I feel like he's very conscious of the image he portrays to the world, but basically a closed doors, he's always making jokes, always finding, I guess, more in line with the Australian Kiwi sort of culture, mm -hmm. but you don't really see that in the public eye. So that perspective, I do miss that relationship with John. In terms of setting aside personal differences, Gordon was a good training partner, definitely a good training partner to train with. Uh, but obviously the 
negative things we can't really talk about outweighed all of those things. And we obviously had to make a decision to leave. The but things yeah, that happened in the jungle. The things that happened in the jungle. Shall never have, be spoken of. That I personally <laughs> cannot speak of. Yeah, but obviously I do miss certain aspects. Like, I mean, not, nothing's all bad, nothing's all good, you know? Yeah, this goes back to your like, uh, everything we're doing is silly. Yeah, exactly. That's why I don't get people take it so serious, martial arts so serious. It's just, it's just pretty stupid, really. Especially in the gi, it looks just, it looks bad. And then I mean, it's pretty silly with with and without the gi. It's just a bunch look, of apes. What's silly around. about no gi and what's silly about the gi and just mixed and matched bottoms there? You know what I mean? Wait, which one? Sambo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I see what you're doing, brother. <laughs> <laughs> you come to my house and offend my people. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, this is we're gonna go to every dark place. Apparently, um, Nick, how did you get with uh, DDS? Like, what was that journey like? Is there uh, try to see if there's things that you remember fondly that that you've uh, gotten from the experience? All right. So the way I started um, training with DDS, um, initially, I was training for like. I well, initially I was I was a bouncer, right? I was I dropped out of college to pursue this uh, fitness modeling career. I ended up signing with a Wilhelmina Models up in New York, and I was like trying trying to get in better shape. And while I was bouncing, kind of the talk of like you know who's tougher came up between the wrestlers and a few of the bouncers that train jujitsu. And uh, you know they uh, convinced right. me to go to a practice, and and I went to my first practice over there, and uh, I for the most part i just controlled everybody got on top of them was able to avoid like kind of like you know shitty submissions because I, I had I had an awareness of, of the sport and, and you know I'm, I'm a fan of fighting and whatnot so um you know i kind of understood it pretty well um and then soon after that i joined a school and my second week of jiu-jitsu i started competing I had pretty good success you know I, I was like subbing a few black belts and beating everybody like you know pretty decisively with points and stuff and uh, about three months into training locally, I got connected with uh, Gordon, Gordon Ryan and John Danaher up in New York. And I started, I committed to, you know, make the drive up there as many days as I could. At the, at the time, I lived in South Jersey and it was about two and a half hour, three hour drive without traffic to Wait, New York. To where, New York. where in South Jersey? Gloucester County, um, Clayton, New Jersey specifically, but Gloucester County. Yeah, so it was about it was about about 130 miles, and without traffic, you know, about and two two and a half hours or so. But on the way back, man, we it'd be three plus sometimes. You know, you're catching that rush hour. What year was this? Do you remember? This that was, was in 2018. For a bit, I forget how young you are. Yeah, I was there before <laughs> before all that. All right, cool. Uh, anyway, you're doing the long drive, and then and then. And then what? Yeah, doing the long drive. And then, uh, you know, once I won ADCC trials, I was able to make a couple bucks. And then, you know, I got my silver medal at ADCC and I was able to afford to live up there in New York and in, in North Jersey area. So I lived up there, trained there full time every day. And, uh, you know, just kind of stuck with the team throughout throughout the turbulent times and found ourselves <laughs> in Austin. In the jungle. In the jungle, with yeah. the things we, we shall not speak of. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what? Uh, are there things that you remember that you've learned from John Donaher from your time you spent with him? Yeah, I mean, I definitely learned a ton from uh, from John and the team as a whole. Like, uh, you know, it's you have to be the guy that asks questions in in the type of environment, right? Because there's not, it's not you're not going to get singled out to be that specific uh, like star or the, the the best guy in the room when you have all these other you know stud athletes. So I really had to seek out and and figure out the kind of questions that I needed to ask. And um, once I became a bit more verbal with my training, and, and you know, uh, I. I'm showing. I'm, I'm expressing all my curiosities about grappling to these guys. Definitely help boost my uh, boost my technique and my career as a whole. Yeah. Did you understand what kind of stuff, like technically, you want to get good at? What fits your body? What like what would be good for you? What What are your weaknesses and all that? So initially, and when I started grappling, I had an innate ability to just get to opponents' back. So I was like, all right, I, I'm good at getting to the back. Let me get. Let me perfect controlling the back and then submitting opponent via rear naked choke. Um, and then besides that, I really focused on leg lock defense. And then eventually came the Roddy lock pass where, you know, I, I'm uh, I'm really good at body lock passing my opponents now. And, the, and um, yeah, it just takes a quite a long time because you have to find uh, different sequences. And then there's always these uh, a, an abundance of opportunities that your opponent gets from these specific sequences. So it takes a while. <sighs> Is there part of you that finds the fact that uh, DGS split up heartbreaking? Um, I definitely 
you know, having one person to go to that runs practice every day, that's, you know, consistent. Um, it, it was definitely, it was definitely, definitely a gift, but now I'm also gifted with uh, many, many other partners. I have Nikki Ryan, um, you know, Craig Jones, Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have Ethan Crelisey and Damian Anderson. So a full team of knowledgeable athletes that I can continue to go to with, uh, multiple questions, but yeah, definitely, definitely, uh, it took me some time to adjust to to training or to learning from you know uh specifically my team and not just one person we should mention for people just listening because you can't visually see that nikki ryan is currently terrified <laughs> <laughs> and craig jones is currently enjoying the fact that nikki ryan is terrified. but anyway uh can you talk about your uh nikki can you talk about your time with dds I started training when I was like around 13. Um, you know, my brother Gordon had started prior to me and uh, I really just went into training just as like a means to exercise and lose weight at the beginning because I was pretty fat as a kid. So I went to the first class, loved it, uh, and then just started training every day at, uh, at Gary's Gym, Brunswick. And then during the summer when I'd get off from school, they would take me up to New York to uh, to train under John. And, you know, I just absolutely loved it. I knew what I wanted to do with my life at a young age. So I ended up dropping out of school actually after my, my freshman year in high school. So yeah, at 15, I ended up dropping out and just pursuing jiu-jitsu full time, uh, you know, training every day up in the uh, the blue basement. Well, like what aspect of jiu-jitsu was, um, made you know that this is the thing for you? It was just something I just enjoyed being, you know, like on the mats every day. I love that there's, you know, a problem solving aspect to it. Um, so it's, you know, it's mentally challenging, it's physically challenging, uh, helps me get in shape. So I just, yeah, right off the bat, I, I knew I loved it. Okay. So, uh, then we'll go to the jungle. What happened in the jungle <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and in general, like, uh, <laughs> I like this, I like this, this, this is like this, like shroud of mystery that she'll never be penetrated. <clears throat> that should never be like- uh, We've got a book deal. It's coming once. Book deal? <laughs> yeah, right. Obviously he left high school. He's not writing it. Right <laughs> uh, okay. I'll do the Russian translation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what are what are things that uh, you enjoy that you remember from working with John Donahue? Yeah. I mean, you know, obviously he's considered one of the best coaches in the world. Um, you know, very charismatic guy when you see him in person. Uh, you know, I, I pretty much was, you know, kind of raised in the DDS. You know, that's where I spent the the majority of my time every day. Uh, so I obviously had very deep connections, you know, with John, my brother, uh, Gary, um, you know, even Eddie Cummings and stuff back then. Um, so obviously I miss interacting with those guys every day. And, uh, you know, it's like they said, it's it's good to have somebody to kind of crack the whip at you every day. Uh, and John, John was very good at that. When you're like younger in your teenage years, you can kind of you like have to get humbled, right? There's like a process to that. Yeah, for sure. And uh, it's a pretty good room to get humbled in, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I was, uh, I started training with them just when like everybody started to break out. Gary was like the biggest name at the time, uh, just cause he had 180 CC trials already. And uh, he had a crazy match with Kron at uh, Kron Gracie at, yeah. at uh, ADCC. But Eddie was just starting to break out. Gordon just started winning EBI. So I, I started training under John, you know, right when, when everything was exploding. What are the good things about life, about jiu-jitsu you learned from your brother? Both me and my brother never really wanted to, you know, work a full-time job doing something that we hate. Um, and he was always, you know, a very confident person. So he just went, you know, full, fully started pursuing jiu-jitsu. Um, so I'm very happy that, you know, he did that and I ended up following in his footsteps because you can ask these guys, I'm a lazy sack of shit out of, mm -hmm. <laughs> out, outside of the, the, uh, the mat. Uh, so that's, that's definitely one thing that, uh, I'm very grateful for. That he paved the way, like you can, you can make money doing the stuff you love. Yeah, exactly. And he was, he was a big reason, you know, why my parents, uh, eventually let me drop out of school because, you know, when, when they were coming up, there was, there's no money in the sport. It was very hard to make a full living. Like if you wanted to actually make a living, you'd eventually have to transfer to MMA. And I feel like Gordon and, and Gary and those guys were, you know, some of the first people to make a very good living off of just jiu-jitsu. At this part of you find it heartbreaking that you've split up from DDS, but also from your brother in terms of spending time on the mat every day. Yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, growing up, you know, obviously he's, he's my big brother. I, I looked up to him a lot. Uh, so I definitely, like I said, I miss interacting with those guys. I was pretty much raised, you know, in that blue basement, you know, the, John was like, you know, a father figure to me. 
Um, so I definitely, you know, miss miss seeing those guys every day. Do you have animosity towards Gordon? And does he have animosity toward you? And uh, what is the source of that? And do you think you'll ever be able to forgive each other? Definitely initially during the uh, the initial split, we, we definitely hated each other at the beginning. Um, but it's definitely started to uh, to calm down. Actually, just prior to you know all this social media drama that's going on currently, he, reached, <laughs> <laughs> he had reached out to me, and that was literally like the first time that we have actually talked since uh, since the split happened. So we didn't talk to each other for was it now like almost two years, um, and that was the first time that you know we, we interacted again and. Um, Overall, you know, he wasn't, you know, aggressive towards me. I wasn't aggressive towards him. You were cracking some jokes. So hopefully the the animosity is going down. Well, there's this uh, Godfather quote that I wrote down. <laughs> I recently rewatched it uh, from uh, from the Don, from Don Corleone, uh, Vito Corleone. The strength of a family, like the strength of an army, lies in its loyalty to each other. Is there some aspect of family that you miss, of the yeah. blood that kind of connects you? They can count on. Yeah. My parents, you know, they, they both raised us that, you know, like family is everything. You never, you know, betray your family or anything like that. Uh, so I definitely, you know, miss them from time to time. Okay. Imagine you're like 40 years from now, sitting on a porch with a shotgun, drinking whiskey, looking over like all the land you've conquered. Uh, looking back to this moment, is the reason you split up a bullshit reason? Um, or is it a good reason? From the perspective of the king who has now conquered the lands, have proven himself, have done everything. I think it was definitely like a justifiable reason for the team splitting. Like it just, with the way things were going, it just was not going to work with, you know, all of us in the same room together. It was a, started, you know, affecting training. People didn't feel comfortable and things. Like, so I definitely think that it was a, a justifiable reason to split. The things that happen in the jungle <laughs> yeah. to be told about in the book. <laughs> is it gonna be an audiobook or is it just gonna be a... and who's gonna voice it? Might be a play. <laughs> a musical? Yeah, musical. <laughs> on Broadway. Um how's your singing voice? Mine's not so good, but Nikki has a beautiful voice. Does he? <laughs> of an angel? Like a headbutt.